John chapter number 14. You're going to begin reading verse number 25. Jesus said, These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Now, in this passage... Jesus is teaching now they still don't truly understand the things that he is teaching through hindsight we understand what he's saying but in verse number 25 he reminds them that he's only here for a moment for a time for a space for a season if you will to accomplish one thing and that was to go to the cross it says these things have I spoken unto you yet being present with you then in verse 26, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name. Later on, Jesus says that he must go because the Comforter had to come. In fact, if you study it out, Christ, even though he was Christ, was still put himself under the restrictions that you and I have in the flesh. He could only be at one place at one time in this mortal coil the Holy Ghost we know is omnipresent all places at all times we know later that the Holy Ghost is the part of the Godhead that seals the soul of a believer after they've received the blood of Christ to their soul to cleanse it from all sin the Apostle Paul talks about us being the tabernacle of the Holy Ghost and the Holy Spirit what are you saying, Brother Jordan? Jesus could be at one place because of the flesh that he, that robe that he put on, that form of mortality, even though he was immortal. But because of that, he was only one place one time. The Holy Ghost is all places at all times. The Son was meant to be the perfect Lamb. Right? The Holy Ghost was meant to be the Comforter. He was also meant to be the Instructor. Right? The Holy Ghost was sent to lead and guide us into all truth. In verse number 26, Jesus echoes that, saying, He shall teach you all things. More important than that, He's also our remembrance. Right? Anybody ever forget something? I got two phone calls this morning. Hey, can you bring this? Why? Because somebody forgot something. I forget things all the time. I'm on the after hours phone this week. There's a good chance that when I wake up tomorrow, because normally I don't have it, I'm going to forget to grab my briefcase and then I'm going to get to work and realize I don't have my laptop, which I need to do work. So then I'm going to have to go back up. You say, how many times has that happened? Too many. Why? Because we've got our routines and we just forget. Now we're going to autopilot mode. One of the gifts of the Holy Spirit is what I like to call Holy Ghost Recall. You were faithful to study it and to put it into you. But because we are human, we are imperfect. We do not have perfect memories. Sometimes we remember in part, and because we remember in part, we miss the whole meaning. Right? You've got to have context. You have to have complete understanding in order to get the message. What are you saying, Brother jo I'm saying that Jesus promised in verse number 26... He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. The Holy Ghost isn't going to help you remember the basketball score 20 years ago in whatever game it was that you want to talk about with your buddies. But the Holy Ghost will remember, will remind you of those things which Christ said. Well, what did Christ say? Well, by his conversation, which biblically conversation means his testimony, he was the Word made flesh. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, capital W. Word was with God, was God. Ever since God was, the Word was. Who's that? Christ. What's the Holy Ghost remind you of? Everything that Christ either was promised to be, that's the Old Testament, under the law. Then all the things that he was going to be for Israel, that was the Messiah, the Deliverer. And in the New Testament, 
He was promised to be our Savior, and then He promised to make us ambassadors, kings and priests. It instructs us on how we ought to live as a saint. The Old Testament's our ensample, showing us those that did and did not according to the will of God. Pointing to what? That there was only one that was perfect, and his name was Christ. Amen. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? I'm saying that the Holy Ghost is real good at reminding you of what the Word says. Everything that Christ taught did what? Fulfilled the will of the Father. What's the Word tell you? What God expects from you in your life? What His will is for your life? That Holy Ghost recall when you're in the midst of a situation where your world is upside down, all of a sudden you remember that verse that you studied so long ago that he uses to speak peace to you or to bring comfort or consolation, encouragement, edification. You think that's just by chance? No, that's a work of the Holy Ghost. It is a blessing that God purposefully gave to you as a child of the King. He knew that on your own we would fail ourselves, let alone fail God. He knew that if you were responsible for remembering it all, that you'd forget. So what did he do? He gave you a memory, a spiritual memory, a flashcard, if you will, to bring those things back to your remembrance. Well, verse number 27. He says, peace I leave with you. You don't leave something if you're still where you put it. All right, let's go back to my briefcase. It is not possible for me to leave something and still be right there with it. I didn't leave it, it's right there. I left my cell phone in the pew when I come up here to teach. If I'm still in the pew, I didn't leave it. It's right there with me. Christ is saying, I'm leaving something. What's that mean? That he's going. You can't leave and still be there. He's just promised that when he leaves, that the Holy Ghost is coming. And he promised before that that the things that he's taught here in person, the Holy Ghost would remind him of that. But he says, I'm leaving. But when I leave... I'm going to leave you something very precious. He left the word. God said that he promised that he would preserve it. He promised that heaven and earth shall pass away, but his word shall not pass away. But that's not something that Christ left for you. That's something that the Father left for you. Preserved for you. This gift comes from the Son. Now, I know we're getting a little deep into the thing. Well, a gift of the Holy Ghost is that remembrance. A gift of the Holy Ghost is conviction. A gift of the Holy Ghost is comfort. Did it not, in verse number 26, call him capital C, comforter? It's one of his very names. What the Father gave? The Father gave his son. The Father gave his word. The Father gave you a place in glory that the Son went to prepare for you. But in verse number 27, Jesus is saying, peace I, he didn't say we. Go and study it. He always says that I and my Father are one, but he separates them. Father, I, Holy Ghost. Christ, because he loved you so, how much did he love you? That he died for you. But because he loved you, knowing that those that would be saved would need it, he says, peace I leave with you. Peace is a gift of the Son. Don't think that that's any strange thing. Did not the prophets prophesy that he would be the Prince of Peace? Is it any wonder that the Prince of Peace would leave peace to those that were bought into his family, bought him with his blood, adopted him through the adoption of sonship. That was the father. And then one day we'll be married. But he says, peace I leave with you. 
No, he says, my peace. Is there any doubt that he says, I leave it and it's mine? So that peace in a New Testament Christian's life, where does that come from? Christ. It comes from our high priest, the one that's seated at the right hand of the Father, ever making intercession for you. Christ said, the Father will give you into the family. The Father will bless you abundantly. The Father is the one that sent me. But he says, but now that I'm here, I'm going to leave you something. Something that nobody else can give you. Only the Son could give you. What was that? Peace. Then he says, His peace. Then he goes on to say, Not as the world giveth, but, or not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Three times. First he says, I leave it. I give. And then again, give I. If you leave something, that may be temporary. If you leave your wallet at home, chances are you're going back to get it. Right? God forbid. I'm sure Josh and Brittany will never confess to this, but they had so many youngins that once you get three of them rounded up and into the car, you'd assume that the other one got in there too. And they might have left a kid. Okay, I don't know that to be true. I'm just making an example. I assume they went back and got the kid. Why? Because all four of them are running around here today. Well, no, Seth may not be here today, but he may be at school. But they're all running around somewhere. If you leave something, it still implies that it belongs to you. But then he goes on to say, I give and give I unto you. Giving and leaving, two different things. He is the Prince of Peace. Wherever he goes, there is peace. Wherever he is, it is peaceful. Because he makes it so. Just like when God said that he hid Moses in the cleft of the rock covered him with his hand. He says, and I'll remove my hand and you can see my glory. God's glory is not God because God said that no man can look on God and live. So if Moses saw it, it wasn't a part of God. It's just something that goes with him. By nature, because God is there, there is also glory. Okay, why do you think David was able to say, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me? Because you go read the beginning of that, he says, God's got me is right smack dab in the middle of his hand. He says, there's not a place that I can go that God hadn't already ordained it for me to be there. His whole desire, it was the man after God's own heart. He wanted to get as close to God as he possibly could. And he says, if I'm right in the middle of God's hand, surely goodness and mercy are going to have to be behind me. Because I know goodness and mercy are around God. He says, I'm going to get so close that goodness and mercy are going to be behind me. That's how close I'm going to get to God. He says, surely, without a doubt, no ifs, ands, or buts about it, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life because I've gotten so close to God that they have to take a back seat. So, same is true with Jesus. Wherever the Son is, there is peace. Is it not foretold that when he comes back and sets up his millennial reign that the lamb will lay down with the wolf? There'll be no more violence. There'll be no more divisions. There'll be no more animosity. Why? Because he brings peace wherever he goes. Well, it says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. There's a distinction on how he gives. He says, I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. He's saying, my gift 
is truly a gift. If you give something, it means that you don't want any, it's, you can't control it no more. If I give something to you, it's no longer mine. It belongs to you. Now, I may have more of it, but what I've given to you, that's yours. Okay, there's a lot of rich people that give money to charities all around the world. Right? Your job gives you a check every month. That check says that they're giving it to you. It's in your bank account after you cash it. They've still got more of it or else the business be closed down. Right? they got plenty of it. But they gave that to you. It's yours now. Well, how much peace does Christ have? All peace. Just like he has all power. Just like he has all glory. But that peace that he gave to you, it was specific. He put your name on it. He said, this belongs to you now. He's still got peace. He's got all peace. But he gave some to you. Not as the world giveth. The world gives and it doesn't last. The world gives, but they can't stop time. You can give somebody a piece of silver today, but one day down the road it's going to become tarnished. It's going to have a patina on it. It's not going to be shiny and it's not going to be the way that it was when it was given. That's not how Christ gives. Christ gives and it is the same forevermore. Because the peace is not contingent upon us, it's contingent upon Him. He said, it's my peace. But I leave it to you. I give it to you. It belongs to you, but there's coming a day that you won't need it anymore. That's why he says, I leave it here with you for now. I've been giving it to you. It's yours. But there's one day where you're going to not need it anymore. He didn't say, I leave it, because he's coming back for it. He's saying, I leave it for you, but there's one day you're bringing it back home. There's a day where we won't need peace any longer, because peace is all that there will be. It's called all of eternity. But there will be no more separation. There will be no more curse of sin. All there will be is us in Christ in glory forevermore. That's why he said, I leave it. Because when he takes you, if he gave it to you, he's taking it back. You're bringing it with you. And when you get there, you're going to say, Lord, thank you, but I don't need this anymore. Why? Because all will be at peace forevermore he says it's his peace that identifies where it came from that identifies what type of gift it is God commended his love towards us and that while we were yet sinners Christ died for us you know that means God gave it to you even though you couldn't receive it he did it on purpose he commended his love towards you. But you can't receive the peace of God, the peace of Christ. You can't lay hands on it and control it. No more than you can control the love of God. No more than you could control the gift that Christ gave on Calvary of shedding His blood for your sins. You cannot control it, but you can receive it. You can't dictate the impact that it has on your life. But you can use it. You can experience it. Best way that I could make that illustration would be if you were to go to one of these highfalutin museums around the world where they've got those giant jewels and diamonds and jewelry and someone can give it to you but there's really not much that you could do with it you can't sell it because some of them things are so valuable there it's not a price tag on it 
You can't take that down to the pawn shop and say, hey, can I get a price for this? That guy's going to say, I don't want anything to do with that. He said, I don't know what to do with that. You can't take it down to the bank and say, hey, I'd like to buy something with this. They'd say, we don't know how to value that. We don't know what that's worth. But see, the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, the world can't put a price tag on it. They've got no use for it. They know that it's something they don't understand, but that doesn't mean that you can't lay hold on it and let it have an impact on your life. The world doesn't understand what it is, but you, being a child of God, you see its true value. You see the impact it's had before, the impact it has now, and how much you need its impact in the future. You wouldn't trade it for anything. But it's His peace. He left it with you on purpose. He said, I leave it so that we wouldn't think that, oh, well, one day He's going to come back and take it. Now He says, I'm doing it on purpose. I leave it because I'm giving it to you. But then in verse number 27, he says, Not as the world giveth. We already said it doesn't tarnish. Age doesn't change it. You can set it outside and erosion won't have an effect on it. All the turmoils in your life cannot impact it because it's his. He didn't just give it to you and then leave it to its own devices. He gave it to you, but every now and then he checks in to make sure that it's still topped off, preserved the way that it was. Wouldn't it be great if the auto dealership that you bought your car from just every now and then stopped by and filled your tank up? Inspected your brakes. Oh, hey, we need to top off these brakes for you. We need to get you new pads. These are wearing down. Hey, tread on the tires look a little low. Well, the Bible says that daily he renews his promises to you. Morning by morning, God decides on purpose, specifically to you, to remake every vow and promise that he made in the Word of God, specifically to you. Every day, Christ comes by and says, just making sure you got all the peace that you need today. The world gives it and then they forget Or they give and then they expect in return. Christ gave, but it was a promise to give more. It's like that good Samaritan that says, here's some money now. Pay for his doctor bills. And if it costs anything more, I'll pay it when I come back through. Well, every time Christ steps into your life, the day you may not know it, may not even perceive it, but there are days that he just walks by and says, you need a little bit more peace today. Amen. Or ahead of time, he'll say, I see what's coming in the horizon. That storm looks a little rough. I'm going to give you a little bit more peace now so that you have enough to get through the storm. He gave with the intention that you would always have it and that it would always be the same and it would never run out. You know what that means? He keeps topping it up. The fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace. Third one. What does fruit do? It grows. What is the purpose of fruit? To be consumed. Sometimes in your life you're giving away the fruit of your tree because the tree is not of you. We were grafted into the vine. The thing that grows out of us is not of us, it is of him. But the fruit that comes off of that tree, which is Christ, are the fruit of the Spirit. Sometimes that love, joy, it's for others to taste and see that the Lord is good. That it didn't come from us, it had to come from somewhere else. Because we're just like them. We can do no good thing in and of ourselves. The arm of flesh will fail you. 
But that fruit of his, it's sweet, it's different. It's good, as the Bible says. But see, fruit grows, why? To be consumed. He said, I give you my peace. I leave it, why? So that it will endure. This is a different kind of peace. This is your peace. Your fruit, we're supposed to bear much fruit. Glorify our Father which is in heaven. That peace that grows on the tree of your life, that's for others. That's not for you. Trees do not eat of their own fruit. They bear fruit and then others consume it. You know where trees get their nutrition from? From the soil. From where they're planted. You know where we're planted? On a solid rock. Next to the river of life. And he put in us a fountain springing up. What's that mean? All of our sustenance, everything that we consume, doesn't come from us. It comes from him. So this peace that he left you, it's not something that you can get from somebody else. Can't be from the tree that other people have. Now you need something that a tree needs to eat. Trees don't eat fruit. Where does our peace come from? It comes from in our roots. It comes from down in a place where nobody else can see it. They may be able to surmise that there's something deep down in there that's holding that tree there. But they can't see it. They may know that the wind and the storm and the gust and tornadoes may come by, but something's got a real good hold on that tree underneath of the ground. Because it may bend, but it don't break. It doesn't tip over. When other trees around it have bark that's fallen off, it just keeps growing. His peace comes from a place way deep down in your soul. Where he left it there on purpose and he continues to supply it. Why? So that you can be stable, sturdy, of a sound mind. That you aren't double hearted as he called Didymus. Who was that? That was Thomas. The one that doubted. He loved God but he also doubted God. He believed, but he also didn't believe. That's why they called him Didymus. That was his nickname. Double-hearted. Why? Because he could never make up his mind. You know what peace does? Peace not only lets you make up your mind, it lets you keep it. Double-minded man is what? Unstable in all his ways. Do you think that it's any surprise that in the book of Acts... We don't find Thomas doing anything for the Lord. I'm sure he was with them, and I'm sure he was involved, but we don't see him called out as doing anything special. Why? Because he was unstable in his faith. Why? Because his heart, his mind was unstable. Peace is your anchor. We have an anchor within the veil. But it's one thing to know that you're anchored, and it's another thing to believe that you're anchored. You know what the difference is? Peace. Peace reinforces faith. Peace sturdies the house that's built upon the solid rock. You could try and throw up a house, but unless you got nails and unless you got support beams and unless you do all of the right things in building the house, it's still going to fall regardless of where you build it. Christ said that a house built some people aren't building they're just throwing shacks together and then they're surprised when it falls apart peace is the nails in the boards of your house that are on the solid rock you know that God put it there God reinforced it you've got faith that it's going to hold peace is that comfort Peace is the, the reinforcing, the reminding, if you will, that you're not in this alone. 
It's real easy to think that when you're on an island that nobody's there with you. Jesus said, no, my peace I leave. If it's a part of him, because he is the Prince of Peace, and he gave it to you, everywhere you go, he's with you. He gave you his spirit on top of that. In the verse before this. But he says, he's even going to remind you of all the different times that I promised that I would be there for you and I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you. He's going to remind you that I'm at the right hand of the Father not for me, but for you. Because he's ever making intercession for us. Christ loves you so much that he sent somebody in his stead to remind you of how much he loved you and all the things that he taught and instructed you. Why? So that he could go and be praying to God for you until the day that the rapture happens. Seated at the right hand of the Father making intercession for us. He went for your betterment. And in his stead he said, I'll leave my peace until we meet face to face. What is that peace? That peace is there to, as the earnest, if you will, of the Spirit. Just to remind you that He does keep His promises. And that if He kept that promise, He's keeping all the other ones too. But as I was thinking about this, thinking about the peace of God, verse number 27, He says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. He left peace and then he gave his peace. He makes sure to distinguish. He says, this isn't peace as the world defines it. Peace as the world defines it means that you're just not shooting and killing each other every day. Doesn't say anything that you don't hate each other doesn't say anything about the fact that if you had the chance you would kill the other no a peace agreement just says we have agreed that right now we're not going to shoot at each other that's not God's peace he says it's my peace I give unto you you say define that in the world's terms the world has never known the peace of God there was a time when it was all that was. That was in the Garden of Eden. His peace was everywhere. But when sin entered into the world, because of man, God's peace was rescinded. Because sin corrupted it and turned it into turmoil. Turned it into death and destruction. Things that used to eat side by side in the garden now fought with each other consumed one another the very first thing that God did after he confronted Adam and Eve was he had to slay some animals why? to make clothing for them because they were ashamed of what they had done who they had become and they had to conceal it before God they said we're not worthy any longer From that moment on, this world has not known the peace of God. I can't use human words to describe something to you that comes from heaven. No more than John in the book of Revelation, you say, well, that seems like a really good picture. It hadn't even entered into the heart of man. John was limited by words that we understood. He's saying, well, he had a, he had a face like brass, but brass doesn't do it justice. That's as close as I can get on the color. And he's got eyes as flaming fire. He says, but fire's not as bright as what I saw in them eyes. White isn't pure enough to describe the color of his hair. It's just holy. He says, but I've got to give you something and white's as close as I can get. When he goes to talk about the streets of gold, you'll always see that as... What's that? That's a comparison. He doesn't say it is. He says it's like or as. 
It's a metaphor saying that's as close as I can get. But that don't do it justice. Well, what is peace? By definition, peace is a lack of turmoil and conflict. You didn't know before you got saved, but after you got saved, in hindsight, you can understand that your life before was in constant turmoil and conflict. Even though you had never signed a declaration of war, your very existence was at war with God because you were the exact opposite of what God intended for you to be. Part of that peace that he leaves with you is peace with God. In all truth, what the world thinks of us does not matter. Why? Because we have peace with our Creator. That's part of His peace. He said, this is something that the world long forgot about. But now that you're under the blood, I'm going to leave this here for a while. I'm going to give this to you. This is something you can't find out there because it's lost long ago by man. But it's peace between you and the Creator. True peace means that it's not just a lack of conflict. True peace between two individuals means that you become equal. You cannot have peace and a lack of conflict or a lack of friction between two people if they are not on equal footing. Christ says, it's my peace that I live with you. He didn't say that we were going to be equal with the Father because even Christ did the will of the Father. But he said, I'll make you a joint heir to the throne of Christ. You know what that means? You're equal with the Son. He says, it's my peace that I leave with you. In the eyes of God, you and I are now the same. We're both sons. We're both children. Everything I own, you own. Everything you own, I own. He says, we are at peace with one another. Because we are now equals, that means that we can interact on equal footing. Christ does not look at you like a servant. Christ was a servant. He served the Father. Even now in heaven, He serves His brethren that are under the blood by doing what? Making intercession for them. He became our high priest to serve before God on our behalf. Christ is a servant. He's the King of kings and Lord of lords, but He's also took on the role or the form of a servant for your benefit. What's He ask us to be? Servants. Why? Because He is. We're equals. But He doesn't look down at us. No, He sees Himself in us. And we ought to see ourselves in Him. You know what that opens the door for? Fellowship. Friendship. Communal time. Just where you enjoy one another's companies. I can't go down to one of them ritzy Beverly Hills country clubs and walk in and just start having a conversation with people. Well, I don't have the credentials. They say, you're not equal with us. You don't meet the requirements to be around here. Even if you do, you didn't file the right paperwork. But you know what I find? When I pray, I can enter directly into the throne room of God. On the same footing as Christ. Not because of who I am, but because of what He did in me. But when I get in His Word, you know what I find? That the Holy Ghost comes and speaks to me. That if I separate myself from this world, just start, as I call it, chewing on or reminiscing, pondering the things of God, I find that every now and then He just walks on by and says, Hey, heard you were thinking about me. You don't spend time around those that you think don't deserve your time. That's just a part of being human. We make distinctions like that, but Christ says there are no more distinctions. I brought peace, and I've left it with you. There's no more sinner, saint, servant, Lord. He says, you and I, 
we're on equal footing. Even though everything we have is because of him, he said, I made you like me. That makes us the same. That don't make sense to us. That's why he had to give us that peace. Unless you embrace that peace, you're always going to live defeated, thinking that you're less than what you should be. That you're not living up to your end of the bargain. He knew all that before he bought you, and he still gave you peace so that you could have fellowship, companionship, that you could commune with the very Son of God. Because there's peace between you, that means that there can be honesty. When you're in conflict with somebody, you don't want to tell them everything. You want to hide secrets. You want to keep things to yourself so that they can't use it against you. Peace means that you can be open and honest and that there won't be ramifications. You can be honest about how you feel and instead of receiving judgment, you can receive help. In peace, there is cooperation. In true peace. In true peace, you care about your neighbor. But did not Christ say that in his Father's house there are many mansions, and if it were not so, he would have told us, and that he goes to prepare a place for us so that where he is, we may be there also. You know what that tells me? You've got a mansion inside of the same house that Jesus has one in. Don't matter that the Father owns it. He owns everything. But he says, I go to prepare a place for you. He says, you're going to live the same place I live. You know what that makes you? It makes you a neighbor to Jesus. Jesus said that we ought to esteem our neighbor and others better than ourselves. When you come and you can confess faults and sins to Christ, you know what he has a desire to do? To remedy it. To help and to assist. Why? Because he is at peace with you. And he loves you. And he wants to see you fulfill the will of the Father. In fact, he is fulfilling the will of the Father as our high priest by assisting us in our infirmities and our weaknesses. But an honest dialogue with Christ is not possible without peace. If you're afraid of judgment, you won't tell other people when you mess up, even though you know you messed up. Even if you've already fixed it and you found out what it was, you won't tell anybody that you made a mistake because you're afraid of ramifications. Christ removed all of that and gave his peace. He says, I give you my peace. Peace in the world, they're still, even though we're friendly with other countries and we're not fighting them, we don't tell all our secrets to everybody else. Government doesn't even tell you all of its secrets. And it's supposed to be your government for your benefit. Christ says, there's no judgment here. You were already judged for sin at Calvary. He says, you have peace now. You know what peace allows? Cooperation. Co-op means both sides are invested. Open communication is necessary. Honesty. But there's also communication and cooperation. Peace means that if there's something to be done because it's good for others, even if it's not the best for us, if it's best for everybody, we're going to do it. You know why you're able to go out to shine as a light, to be a witness to this world, even though the world tries to keep you from doing it? even though the world's going to fight against anything that has God's name attached to it, even though the very people that you're trying to help may cuss you, may spit at you, may try to kill you, like they did Stephen. Go study it out. All Stephen started doing was just preaching to them about Jesus. And they got so angry they tried to trample him, and he still kept preaching. 
Like, Brother Ron, I've never been so full of the Holy Ghost that I was preaching. They tried to run me over like a bunch of elephants. And then in the midst of all of it, I just kept preaching louder. What are you saying? He got some grace that I've never had to know. And then he kept on preaching until what? Until they stoned him. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? There was cooperation there. You think Stephen did that on his own? No, because when Stephen was done preaching and he looked up, he saw Jesus standing ready to receive him. Christ said, I give you my peace, Stephen. If you know everything's all right between you and God, you can charge hell with a water pistol. Some people even do it with a gasoline tank. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? That doesn't happen because they're superhuman or super spiritual. It happens because they know that it's best for those on the other side of that gate. The gates of hell shall not prevail against the church of the living God. But you want to know why people aren't going and fighting against the gates of hell like they used to? Because too many people have not enjoyed the peace that Christ gave them. Because in times of peace, you're not focused about what's best for you. Everything's good. You're at peace. You've got peace with the very God of heaven. What else could you want? You want what God wants. That's for others to receive that peace. To be brought into the family. And Christ says, you're not going to go it alone. Everywhere you go, I go. Because we have peace between one another. Go study the relationship between Jonathan and David. Even before David got married into Saul's family and legally became the brother of Jonathan, even before then, Jonathan always saw him as what? His equal. He said, there's peace between me and him. He says, Dad, when you look at him, it's just like looking at me. And Saul said, you crazy. He said, I don't care. It's so. He says, we're the same. You don't make covenants with people that are less than you or that you don't believe can hold up to their end of the bargain. Well, God made a very strong covenant with you. Why? Because Christ gave you his peace. He left it for you on purpose. But there's another thing about that peace of God. I was thinking about this. He says it's his peace that he leaves with us. God's peace don't make sense to the flesh. We know that he was in a boat one night. That the disciples thought that it was the end, that they was going to die. Jesus was asleep. Asleep in a boat that the text tells you is full of water. I don't know about you, but full means it's full. But it says he was laying down with his head on a pillow. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? I know it don't make sense to the flesh, but if you believe it the way that it's written, that means Jesus was underwater sleeping. But how'd he breathe? He's God. He don't need air. He was at peace, but they weren't at peace. Because they know that boat can't float if it's full of water. Well, if it was full of water, how come it didn't sink already? Because Jesus was on board. We know that. But see, he had peace, Christ, but the disciples didn't. God's peace is not dependent upon what your situation is. In the world, it depends on your spiritual situation. The old ship of Zion's been beat up, but it keeps on sailing. Why? Because it's got peace. The ship doesn't keep itself afloat. The captain of the ship keeps the boat afloat. But see, God's peace, if you have it, Jesus doesn't need to stand up and say, Peace be still. You know why he did that in that moment? Because of the disciples, for their sake. They did not have peace, and he desired to give them peace. But he says, My peace I leave, I leave it, I give it unto you. You've already got it. We think that that means that all of our problems get smoothed over and everything's an easy ride. That's not what I'm saying. 
It's not what the Bible says. Not what the Bible teaches. You know what the Bible does teach? That his peace, which passeth all understanding, even in the midst of the worst storm of your life, you can lay down on a pillow in a boat that's filled with water and lay your head down and go to sleep. Because that's the peace that Christ had. That's his peace. Our peace is peace be still, stop everything, the boat's going to sink. Jesus said boat wasn't going to sink. I was sleeping on it. Even though it was full of water, it didn't dip any lower below the water. He said, you look past my peace and sought your own peace, and that's why they were robbed of a blessing. Same thing when he walked across on the water. He said, I'll see you on the other side. They didn't take peace in the promise of God. So when the storm blew up, they're tiring themselves out. They're rowing themselves to death trying to get that boat to the shoreline. And then Peter finally had a thought. Hey, Lord, if it's you, let me walk out to you on the water. And he said, come on. And what did Peter do? Peter walked on water for a while until he took his eyes off of the Lord. What happened? For a moment, he had the peace of God. He had the peace of Christ. Because when Jesus said, come, he said, I know that voice. And if Jesus said, I can do it, I can do it. He walked all the way out there on water. At that point, the storm didn't matter to him no more. And then he got out there, and then what? And then he realized where he was and what situation he was in. And all of a sudden, that peace that he had, it slipped. And when his peace went away, he started sinking. You saying, Brother Jordan, are you saying that the peace of God would let us walk on the water of all of our storms? I'm not saying that. It might. Or you might have to be in a boat filled with water believing that it's just going to make it to the other side. But instead of fighting and wearing yourself out and tiring yourself to the point of exhaustion, you can sit in peace believing that God's got that under control. Instead, maybe you're going to shout to other people, Hey, your boat's sinking. They're like, yeah, but it's not filled with water. And it's like, my boat's not sinking. Throw out a life vest to some people. Say, hey, the one that did this for my boat, even though you don't think it can float, but it's still floating, he can do that for your boat. They can shift your attention from where you're at to what's going on around you. Peter had the peace of God as he was walking across that water but even though he was walking on water storm was still going on around him nothing else changed except what he lost the peace of God then he started sinking did you know that IBC is now on iTunes TuneIn SoundCloud and Google Play head on over to your podcast provider and subscribe today and as always thanks for listening